It's my pleasure this morning to introduce you, uh, Professor Robert Schubert from VPI, Virginia Polytechnic Institute. As a graduate student at VPI, I had the pleasure of working with Bob Schubert. <clears throat> He's uh, been very active, both as undergraduate work and his graduate work, in solar energy and passive energy design. <clears throat> He's published widely, and he, before he finished his master's work, he published his first book, Alternative Natural Energy Sources, that's available through Van Nostrand Reinhold and is in our library. He informs me that he's currently working at VPI with thermography, which is infrared, infrared photography, in trying to evaluate the thermal loss effects of solar storage. <clears throat> Professor Schubert did ask that I keep his introduction short, and we are running a little bit low, so I will, without any further explanation of his qualifications, introduce you, Professor Robert Schubert. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, with you this morning. And um, when I was asked to speak, I was asked to speak about passive energy systems. So what I would like to do is present a series of slides that might uh, hopefully clarify some of the issues that, uh, that involve the utilization of passive uh, solar systems. And um, the most of the slides that you'll be seeing were taken in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and in the Santa Fe area. There was a conference that was held last year about the same time on the utilization of passive systems. So since we have an, uh, an hour's worth of time to present this in, it's best that we get started. So could I have the lights, please? Early cultures were adept at using the sun to temper their environments. They were very in tune to the environment. And through the designs, the materials, and the orientations of their buildings, they were able to modulate the interior temperatures of their buildings. On a plateau in uh, Colorado, along this canyon wall here, was a civilization that's known as Mesa Verde. Now, they were able to temper their environments and to produce uh, interior temperatures that were conducive um, to their, their living habits by first so orienting the building uh, there, uh, around the, the cliff wall. The, the buildings were built in such a way as that the uh, sunlight penetration would be exposed during the winter months and excluded during the summer months. So it was this process of orientation that uh, allowed them to, to temper their environment. It's being in tune to, to the responsiveness yeah, of their off. environment. Really hard to see that on the, grid. the Pueblo Indians also used a technique, and, uh, which is carried over in a lot of our passive designs today, called thermal mass in buildings. The, uh, the adobe buildings had a 14-inch uh, thick wall, sometimes even greater, that had an effect of modulating temperature. Now, what this modulation effect basically does is that the, the wall during the day absorbs heat because it is so thick the heat can't migrate to the other side of the wall. So at nighttime, when uh, the temperatures drop, this heat is re-radiated back into the building when it's needed. And also, the heat is re-rated back to the outside. So back when the morning time comes, the wall is at sort of a negative potential, so that it's ready to accept heat and to start this process all over again. Very important concept. And basically, it, as you can see here, the, um, this is the outside temperature, this scale right here, peaking around noon and then dropping off at, towards the evening. But because of the thermal mass, look at the, the, the temperature on the interior. It has effect of even out the peaks. Uh, 
Now, at this time, I'd like to make a distinction between active and passive systems. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit this building at the uh, University of Colorado, uh, solar heated and cooled building. Uh, this picture was actually taken uh, a couple of months ago where they it looks like they've started to add some more collector area. I don't know exactly what they were doing with the, with the project. But this is not the system schematic, but what it does, it, it points out what's involved in an active system for the collection and utilization of energy. Of course, the, the collection area is a flat plate collector oriented in such a way to maximize the sunlight exposure. Then you have some type of uh, a medium that transfers the heat from the solar collector to a storage tank or to a distribution loop in the house. Now, the biggest thing that separates an active system from a passive system is that this energy exchange is taken care of by pumps, by some type of motive force that uh, transfers the heat from one point to another. And sometimes, depending on uh, what's required, these systems become quite complex. There's a logic control. Uh, there's a lot of interface equipment, so this, this temperature can be used, at, the collected heat can be used to modulate the interior temperature. Now, these temperatures are, are controlled within a very close tolerances, something that we are experiencing you know, with the mechanical systems that we have today. Now, this is an example of a passive system, which was um, done in 1967 in Odello, France, done by the CNRS laboratories. A, basic, a basically different form of, uh, of transfer system involved here, in which convective air flows are used to distribute the heat from one point to the other. Very simple thermosiphoning principle. Cool air from the floor goes in through these um, solar collectors, is heated as it becomes warm, it rises, escapes through the top vent, and is circulated throughout the building. The, uh, the wall that they used in here was a two foot thick concrete wall with uh, an air chamber of about four inches approximately and a single pane of glass in front. 516 square feet of collector in this building, which uh, was about 818 square feet. Now this process, or particularly for this, um, this wall, which is known as a trom wall, can be used to circulate air also, as in the summertime operation at the top. Because we have this natural convective airflow, air can be pulled from the outside through the building, pulled up by the collection system exhausted at the top. Maybe this gives you a better idea of what's actually happening there. This is in the summertime operation. The, what uh, separates the summertime from the wintertime operation uh, the location of the dampers and how they're operated. The, uh, the dampers in the wintertime operation would be closed at the top, the interior damper would be open, and uh, air could be circulated into the uh, space. Now, the, um, this wall could possibly experience a sort of backflow effect, say at nighttime temperatures. So actually what it would do is suck temperature through the collector and actually conduct heat away from the living space. And that was taken care of by utilization of a thermal sink. Cold air would come in and settle down at the bottom. It would no longer continue on its path through the collector. Now, as you can see, um, a passive system compared to an active system is, um, is a lot simpler, for one thing. More important to us as architects and designers these components can actually become, uh, it's an intrinsic part of the building itself. There is not a separate uh, 
it's not a separate element as a solar collector. Uh, it's an actual part of the building itself. And as a result, uh, a cost can be lower because of it. Because of the simplicity, the, uh, there's less failures incurred with it. So the next buildings, well, the next couple of buildings that we'll see are located in the Albuquerque area. This one you might be familiar with is a Steve Bear house. Uh, he calls it a, a cluster of 10 exploding Ramic dodecahedra, but it's just a fancy name for the, uh, the shape that he uses there for his buildings. The wall construction is an aluminum honeycomb sandwich construction. This might give you a better idea of what you have here. Uh, honeycomb section to give it structural rigidity and also a styrofoam insulation poured in to give it an effective insulation. I believe the, um, the panels have an effective R value of about an R2. Now, I think this is one important thing right here that you start to see through, through these projects. And that's what it, uh, the concept of uh, uh, a, a modulating barrier, a modulating thermal barrier, so that you can not ha have the problem of heat loss at night and still have the, pro uh, the advantage of heat gain uh, during the daytime. Now, heat is stored in these 55-gallon drums. The whole building um, of 2,000 square feet uses approximately 90 55-gallon drums, which are 90% filled with water. OK, and which um, these are all stacked behind four of these uh, walls. The reflective panels also reflect light back into these drums, which are painted black on one side, white on the other and for storing. At nighttime, these panels are raised by a simple uh, uh, hand crank mechanisms that uh, prevents the heat loss outward and lets the heat come into the uh, living space. Here you see in their closed position. A detail of the uh, panel and how it's sealed on the edges. And that's something that uh, gets overlooked a lot when uh, movable insulation panels, the detailing around the edges, that, that is really a critical issue on trying to provide a good air seal around. The glazing on the collector is a single pane gla uh, glass. All these drums, these 90 drums, give them a capacity of 5,000 uh, gallons of water. Now, they also have storage potential. Well, try by hand. Sorry about that. Um, also, the red painted wall are, and the uh, floor surfaces act as a, a storage medium. Now, the way the temperature is controlled are by using insulating curtains so that once the, uh, the temperatures in the interior start to get uh, too high, the curtains are drawn over the, uh, the barrels. A detail of the winch mechanism that's used to crank the panels up and down. The interior walls are our adobe construction, also help to add to the thermal mass of the building. The pattern that you see down here at the bottom is a, uh, a skylight that you can see here that was done by a friend of theirs. Uh, most of the buildings that you'll be seeing are of a uh, owner-built nature. And you can see a much more concern with detail uh, in their buildings. An interior shot. Now the the building is ventilated by a series of vents located in the uh, the top portions of the roof areas. A series of open vents that can uh, open and close to help vent the air. Uh, 
again, another device that comes in the category of a variable thermal barrier that some of you might be familiar with is the Skylid, also developed by Steve Baer of Zoneworks. Now, this barrier is uh, actuated by two Freon cylinders. It's located on a skylight, as you can see here. The, the cylinders contain Freon, partially evacuated cylinders, and that sense temperatures and balances from one side to the other. Say that there was heat loss occurring from the building to the outside, say on a cloudy, uh, a cloudy day. The Freon, the heat going past the Freon cylinder caused the Freon to be evacuated, be transferred through that tube there to the cylinder on the other side. Since the cylinder is cooler, the Freon condenses and causes an actual weight imbalance there, causing the whole louver to close. Just as soon as the sunlight comes back out again and there's uh, energy gain going into the building, the, uh, the whole process reverses itself. A very uh, unique concept and uh, of, uh, of energy. Here you can see the skylight on the, uh, on the outside. Domestic hot water is heated by a flat plate collector. The patio area on the outside, the shading is provided by a series of movable slats that you can see here, so that he has control over actually how much sunlight is penetrating down into that space. Also, domestic water is provided by water pumping. Uh, it supplies it to, to this cluster of housing and plus uh, another one down from the hill. This house is actually located, uh, I'd say, maybe 100 yards from, the, uh, from Steve Vera's house. This is a Paul Davis residence, approximately 900 square feet. The type of construction is an adobe construction. Now look at how they, the responsiveness of the, the materials of the wall construction to the orientation. The north and south bottom walls are 10 inch adobe with two inch styrofoam insulation on the exterior. And the north side, since it's bermed almost all the way up, uh, less insulation was used. The east and west walls, uh, again, was a double adobe wall, each about 10 inches with a four inches of fiberglass in the cavity. The type of collector used is an air thermocycling type of collector. Approximately 320 square feet in area. It is single glazed using standard window glass. Here's a cross section through the collection and storage system to give you some idea of what's happening here. The, uh, the six layers of expanded metal lath is located in the collector. It's actually the absor uh, absorptive surface painted with a non-selective coating or just a flat black coating. Air is uh, drawn in through the bottom of the collector through the six layers up through the storage tank and back down through the rock bed storage. There's a, a lath floor that the, the rocks sit upon, and the air circulates down through back and to the bottom of the collector again to start the, the whole process over again. The storage volume, um, the depth is about four feet and 43 cubic feet of, of cobble-sized rocks, which is about this size. To give you a better idea of how it's distributed through the house, um, all controls are manual controls that the, the user operates uh, dampers to control the airflow through the building. Cool air from the building uh, is collected at the back through a return duct that goes through the bottom of the storage uh, container at nighttime and, uh, and can, be, can rise up through there and into the living space. It's a continuing process of heat exchange.
looks like they experienced some uh, damage there of the glass collectors on the side. Uh, glass doesn't necessarily have to be used. A fiberglass material can also be substituted. The, uh, the pipe that you see there in the center is a, um, a black PVC pipe. And it's used as a hot water preheat for his domestic hot water needs. As you can see, um, there's an awful lot of dust involved with the, uh, with the system. That's because no filtering system or no filters were located in the ducts and that he did not wash the rocks before they were put in the storage bin. But this is what the expanded metal lath looks like. This is the absorber surface of the collector. A detail of the connections of the, uh, the PVC pipe to a main header. The, uh, the next house is a Karen Terry residence, which is located in Santa Fe, New Mexico, pretty close to, to Albuquerque. Um, an unusual design in house. It's sort of a stepped arrangement that conforms to the slope of the house, uh, to the slope of the site. The collector is uh, skylights effectively, 380 square feet. Each one of these uh, areas is double glazed and has insulating panels that can be moved there at the night time. Give you some idea of the floor plan and of the, uh, the details of the collection system. What you did not see on the, um, the building were well, a series of movable new, uh, louvers that can be taken off in the winter time but it's to prevent uh, excessive heat gain in the winter time. The insulating shutters to prevent uh, nighttime uh, heat loss uh, swung up against the, the ceilings. Again, that we can see this response enough to orientation where the north side is uh, semicircular in shape to, to provide a minimum amount of exposed surface area to reduce the heat loss. The vent that you see there at the upward hand is used to, uh, to ventilate the whole building. You'll see a detail of that later on. The construction is adobe brick, uh, in insulated on the outside with two inches of polyurethane foam. The, uh, the day that we were there, they were putting stucco on the, uh, on the outside. So this gives you some idea of the stepped arrangement there. Now, this is the, uh, the storage for the building. Now, the, the thermal capacity of the building is provided in water-filled drums that form these walls or partitions, um, better known as boncos. And there are 22 steel drums um, stacked throughout here and stacked on, on end, one on end of each other. Um, they are co covered with a uh, wire mesh and then covered with adobe to get a uniform appearance. This is actually the top of the wall. And you can see the undulation in the wall surface, which is actually the, uh, the drum. The loft area. From the loft area, you can see it clearly down through the, uh, the three different levels. And this is the vent that we saw at the, in the back side um, that's used to draw air down from the bottom. Windows are located at the bottom of the um, of the structure and pulls. The whole air is pulled through that throughout the building. The next one is a David Wright residence, also located in Santa Fe. Uh, it's uh, semi-cylindrical in shape. Uh, an adobe type of construction 
the wall size changes from 17 inches at the bottom level to 13 inches at the top floor. The walls are covered with polyurethane insulation and covered with uh, stucco. Storage in the, uh, in the building is provided by water-filled drums that you see along there, the, uh, the front wall at the bottom, and also the, the floor. Um, the floor, there's a brick floor with sand. It gives them about a 24-inch uh, capacity, thermal capacity. Some of the energy conservative aspects of the building 